Okay, let's get started. Welcome everybody to the special year seminar on theoretical machine learning at the Institute for Advanced Study. Today, we are pleased to have Maxim Reginsky as our speaker. Maxim is an associate professor at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and has done a wide variety of interesting work on probability and stochastic processes, deterministic and stochastic control, machine learning, optimization, and information theory. Today, he'll tell us about his work on neural SDEs, deep general models in the diffusion limits. Please welcome Maxim Roginski. All right, thank you. Um... Let me get the timer started just uh, so I keep myself um, on track. Okay, so thank you for, uh, for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, visit IAS, even if virtually. Um, so this talk will be on uh, the theoretical aspects of uh, neural stochastic differential equations, um, which we uh, uh, did with uh, my PhD student, Belinda Tsen, she's a graduate student in the Department of Computer Science at the uh, University of Illinois. And this work was presented um, at Colt 2019, um, probably the last Colt uh, for a while um, with uh, in-person attendance. Um, but uh, because of the sort of obvious interest to these models, I felt like it would be a good um, sort of a, a paper to talk about because it uh, really discusses the expressive capabilities of, uh, of neural SDEs. So uh, let's see. Let's start with um, kind of the very uh, general motivation or introduction. So when we talk about deep generative models, um, what do we mean? First of all, what is a generative model? In, in very broad strokes, uh, it is a mechanistic relationship between two random objects. So the latent variable X and the observed variable Y. Uh, I'm departing from tradition. Typically, if you read machine learning papers on generative models, the observed variable is typically X and the latent variable is typically Z. Um, I come from sort of a, a strange background uh, and uh, well, mostly mathematical physics for my PhD and then uh, shifted into information theory, machine learning and control and control anything that's sort of hidden or unobservable is the state X and anything that's observable is Y. So here we are. Anyway, so the idea is that you uh, postulate a joint distribution of X and Y. Um, and normally the relationship between X and Y is encoded in the likelihood model, um, right? Um, and X is drawn from some prior P. In deep generative models, or uh, what uh, a probabilist would call a time and homogeneous Markov chain. The idea is that the latent variable X, the one that sort of hides all the randomness uh, inherent in, um, in generating Y, or at least most of it, this uh, latent variable X is generated through a process that takes several steps, right? So, so we could start with uh, an initial draw, let's say we call it X naught from some distribution, and then we transform it through a series of simple, um, let's say simple to implement, or simple to sample from uh, steps. And then after a while, after let's say, what am I using, k, after k of these steps, we end up with a sample xk, which we then feed into our observation model and that gives us the observed variable, right? So the depth here comes from the layering of, uh, of these um, transformations that give you let's say x0 to x1, x1 to x2, et cetera. Um, and uh, why would we use depth? By now, I think everybody is uh, more or less on, uh, on the same wavelength. It gives us flexibility. We can uh, compose fairly simple steps. Let's say we can take the current, let's say xj minus one, pass it through a nonlinearity, add some noise and keep going. Um, and if this nonlinearity has parameters that we can differentiate, um, then this leads to inference procedures that can be efficiently implemented using something like backpropagation. In fact, this was the basis of stochastic backprop um, by Resende et al. 
of course, uh, a number of papers kind of came up with the same idea independently. And since then, it has been really uh, uh, an interesting sort of a, a combination of ideas in, uh, um, let's say, deep neural nets, variational inference, hierarchical bays, and related things. Right, so what we're going to do here is consider what happens when uh, we have a very simple type of model where we just add Gaussian noise uh, after passing current state through a nonlinearity. But we're going to scale the uh, sort of, you could call it a step size H or A, I guess I'm using eta here, um, step size eta, and then just iterate this for a number of steps, right? And then uh, after K steps, you're going to stop and output the observed variable. And here the randomness comes from essentially the initial, um, well, here the initial state is deterministic. Uh, X naught is deterministic, but you could make it random. But most of the randomness really driving this process is uh, a collection of IID samples from standard Gaussian measure on RD, let's say, which we will denote by gamma D throughout the, throughout the talk. So what I'm interested in is the diffusion limit where what we're going to do is take uh, the number of these layers or steps of this process to infinity in a controlled manner. Right, we're going to set, let's say, our step size eta to be one over k and then take k to infinity. And uh, well, if you're being careful about this and uh, um, dot all the i's and cross all the t's, you end up with a diffusion process, right? Uh, in the limit, in this continuous time limit, you end up with a diffusion process. So now instead of um, having discrete time updates, you have a continuous time update driven by a standard Brownian motion on RD, and then you incorporate the nonlinearity non that, that updates the states. Uh, that becomes a drift, and then you have this drift on, superimposed on top of a standard Brownian motion, right? And then uh, you run this process for uh, one unit of time, whatever it is, and, and then you stop and you output the um, observation variable, right? This, you, you output Y. And of course, these uh, type of, uh, this type of diffusion process has been considered as a generative model um, in, uh, in a number of papers. Clearly, we're not the first ones to have, uh, to have thought of it. And uh, some of these papers were motivated by more of a neuroscience view. Um, and you can actually add jump processes on top of this to make it even more realistic in terms of computational neuroscience. And some of these were motivated by more stochastic filtering approaches where uh, the Gaussian noise could come from some device noise or something like that. Um, but the point is that you end up with a diffusion process whose drift has some parameters that you could in principle optimize. I'm not considering the case where the diffusion matrix um, itself, so the, the quantity modifying the Wiener process has parameters. This is gonna be a very simple thing where um, the diffusion matrix is equal to identity. And of course, this sort of thing has, uh, um, has appeared in a variety of uh, places, or at least you know some some kind of related strands. This continuous time limit of adaptive uh, stochastic algorithms has been sort of a, a, a recurring theme in a number of works on uh, control, signal processing, optimization, you name it. Part of the reason is, in some sense, dealing with differential equations, analyzing their behavior over time. Um, stability related considerations is just much easier than uh, dealing with recursions because calculus somehow, at least to me, calculus is easier than uh, working through complicated recursive formulas. Um, and of course, deterministic neural nets in continuous time, um, these papers, um, so I list the number of papers. One, one of the early, earlier ones is by Morris Hirsch, um, who's a mathematician. So he had a paper in neural networks, uh, it was a journal on uh, what he called convergent dynamics of continuous time neural nets. So the idea was uh, specifically that you have a feed forward neural net which evolves in continuous time and you look at the activation dynamics. So you start with some initial condition and you propagate that through the dynamics and you see what happens and there are questions related to stability. Um, and this sort, of, uh, this sort of work has been uh, um, picked up recently, um, particularly by, by this really uh, sort of uh, um, creative inspirational paper by, uh, by uh, Ricky Chen uh, and uh, uh, collaborators on the neural ODEs. And there the, the you know, really nice observation was that, well, you can essentially um, 
if you take your uh, ODE as a primitive, then you can implement all the other things such as backpropagation using, well, another ODE solver. So the idea is to take the adjoint um, equation method, which has been sort of the staple of stochastic control and system optimization um, since uh, uh, at least 1960s. If you take that and implement it using an ODE solver, you can essentially uh, train these objects using uh, any sort of a um, black box ODE solver as a primitive. And obviously the same thing um, could have been applied to stochastic objects, right? So you can, you can take a recurrent neural net, obviously, like I said, make it continuous time, you can add some noise, some stochasticity, and that becomes essentially a neural SDE, right? If you make the drift and the diffusion coefficients parametric, you can essentially implement uh, very interesting stochastic processes. One of the earliest papers I know that tried to do this is by Eugene Wong in 1991. Eugene Wong was uh, um, uh, working on sort of probability and stochastic processes. And this was one of the in interesting viewpoints that said, well, we can take uh, something like a hop field net and implement it in continuous time as a diffusion process. And he analyzed its convergence, you know, identified conditions like the spectral gap um, that uh, lead to its convergence um, and things like that. And since then, this, this sort of idea has been picked up in a number of papers by neuroscientists, by machine, in machine learning, uh, by in, in mathematical finance, you name it. Uh, and of course, uh, um, one of our motivations was, well, you know, let, how, how rich and expressive are these models? And now um, neural SDEs are a thing, right? I mean, I'm here uh, in this last bullet, I'm listing the papers that really, you know, took this idea and, and, uh, and ran with it, developed it into a number of procedures for efficient um, backprop with neural, uh, with, with SDE solvers. Um, so there's some follow-up work that Belinda and I did, which was sort of a, a, in a more applied vein, uh, where we took a very simple idea. We said, okay, so you can, you can do forward mode AD with uh, uh, SDE solvers. And since then, uh, I, I will, and I want to highlight uh, a really, really nice paper by, uh, by Lee et al. that uh, I guess um, is in this year's AI stats, which I guess will also be virtual. And uh, in this work, the, um, you know, very, very sort of a, a number of very, very original creative ideas were combined to make uh, backward mode AD work with SD solvers. So that it, it combines a number of really, really nice uh, um, concepts. And I really recommend looking at this paper. Okay, so, so let's, um, so let's uh, really focus on what we're doing here. So we'll look at these deep generative models and the diffusion limit. And there are three questions that we would like to really answer um, about these models. And they pertain to expressiveness, inference, and simulation, right? So what is expressiveness? Really uh, expressiveness in the context of generative modeling more or less hinges on the ability to draw a wide class of distributions for the latent variable. In this case, latent variable is just, you have this diffusion process that runs for one unit of time. I'm gonna use seconds here just for concreteness. So X1 is, uh, is the state of this diffusion after one second. So you look at X1 and then based on that, you sample your Y. And really the observation model that, that generates Y typically is much simpler than the process that generates uh, the latent objects. So if you can generate a very rich class of uh, distributions for your latent object, that makes your model more expressive, right? So the question is how, um, what is the class of achievable distributions? How, how, how broad can you make this? This will be the main focus of this, uh, of this work. Then you can also ask questions like inference. Well, if you do have a model of this sort, how can you fit it to data? Right, so now you observe uh, a bunch of uh, uh, realizations of this, uh, uh, y, y1 through yn, you compute the likelihood for each parameter. Of course, you know, computing that is going to be a nightmare because this is given by a diffusion process. So how can you approximately uh, maximize this log likelihood, let's say, uh, or, or minimize negative log likelihood? And finally, there's the, um, there's the efficient simulation question. So these models are continuous time, and it's all wonderful. But then when we have to implement it, 
typically there is going to be some discretization going on. How can we make this uh, uh, process of computing and working with these models efficient? How do we uh, use resources efficiently? Uh, and like I said, in this presentation, I'll mostly focus on the first aspect, which is expressiveness. Um, and I'll mention a few things about variational inference and simulation. Um, but uh, uh, all of these aspects, of course, are uh, interesting directions for, uh, for research. Right, so, and this kind of lists what's, what's, uh, uh, what's coming up. So what's coming up is, well, how useful are these models? How rich is the cluster distributions we can generate? Um, right, expressiveness is a natural question about that. And finally, unbiased simulation, like I said, I'll, I'll, I'll touch upon this very, very briefly, but the interesting thing is that there is a way to make um, a simulation procedure for these models. Mostly when, when people talk about simulation, they talk about computing expectations of various test statistics in uh, an unbiased way, such that the, uh, um, the variance of these estimates is also controlled. And uh, ideally, you would like to obtain the optimal, uh, optimal scaling with a number of independent runs. So how can you achieve that? Okay, so, um, so first look at the, uh, let's, look, let, let, let's look at the exact sampling and variational inference. So for now, I'm, I'm not really restricting myself to neural nets or anything parametric. We're going to first look at exact sampling. So here's a target measure that I want for x1. Can I sample from it in some efficient way, in some optimal way, right? And it turns out that both this question and the question of variational inference, in other words, how can I uh, compute the log likelihood for, uh, for a sequence of observation, both these questions really hinge on the same sort of a control theoretic idea. Um, so we're going to look at a very abstract problem where now we have, um, a diffusion process. We're going to call it a reference diffusion process. So this B of X and T is some drift. It's a, uh, it's a time varying vector field that generates the drift for this, uh, for this diffusion process. And uh, what we're going to do is add a drift to this reference diffusion. And this drift is going to be denoted by U. In this case, I'm, uh, I'm restricting it to uh, what are called Markov uh, drifts. So this is um, the situation where at each time t, the drift that you add only depends on x t, where you are right now, and the time t. But one could consider more general classes of drifts, but uh, in, in this instance, you can actually kind of argue that there's no loss of generality in doing this. But the point is that a drift um, u is a function on space, rd, and time, which is the unit interval. It, uh, so again, it's a time varying vector field. Uh, and we add it to the drift of our reference process. So each of these, we can think about it as controlling the diffusion because what you're doing is you're kind of making it deviate from what is prescribed by the reference model, presumably with some goal in mind. So for each U, we're going to denote this uh, corresponding diffusion process by X U. What is our goal? Um, our goal is the following. We're going to run this process for one second. Um, and each time we add a drift, we pay a price. The price will consist of two terms. First, there's going to be the control cost, which is essentially this uh, um, integral over here. What we do is we integrate the squared norm of the added drift over time. And obviously the larger uh, drifts, the more energetic ones are sort of pricier. And our goal is to get this process to a point X1 such that the terminal cost is small. How do we define the terminal cost? Well, the terminal cost here is given by negative log of some positive function G that's given to us. And this, is, and this depends only on the final state of this diffusion. So the idea is that we somehow uh, perturb a reference process in order to attain um, final state with small expected value of negative log G, while at the same time we pay a price for making, the diff uh, making this drift to uh, uh, making this, this, this process drift too much from the reference one, right? So that's the idea. And what I'll show is that by choosing this uh, G in just the right way, you can sort of address both the sampling and the inference problems in a unified manner. All right, so, um, so first of all, I want to um, 
highlight since you know this is I guess I'll, there's there's more time than usual. I, I wanted to highlight uh, a very interesting sort of an idea, and we're not the ones to think of it. Obviously, I mean this this uh, um, connection between diffusions and partial differential equations goes back to very very classic work. Uh, in, in probability. In fact, sort of one could argue that somehow this connection between diffusion processes and, and partial differential equations goes all the way back to, uh, to Kolmogorov with his foundational works on, uh, on Markov processes. But here's an interesting idea that uh, every time we have a parabolic partial differential equation of this form, right, so we're solving for a function x, uh, h of x and, and t, um, on space and a finite time interval with a terminal condition. So here we're prescribing a terminal condition. So we want to solve for this function h in such a way that at time one, uh, we have a given g that this function uh, gives us. And uh, the um, vector field b and the positive semi-definite matrix a are given to us. And this is called parabolic PDE uh, because of the form of this uh, sort of second order differential equation second order PDE rather. So I want to solve for this function. It turns out that um, the solution of this PDE can be given probabilistically by looking at a diffusion process whose drift is given by the vector field that's in the first order term here um, and whose diffusion matrix is given by a suitable factorization of uh, the matrix A. So here we express it as sigma sigma transpose where sigma is some matrix. Um, typically there, there are issues related to, um, there are issues related to this choice of factorization, but if A of X is positive definite for each X, then taking its square root is uh, a canonical choice. And this uh, diffusion process has what's called an infinitesimal generator, this, which is this uh, um, first, uh, this is a second order uh, differential operator linear differential operator that acts on any function h. Um, then you can show that in fact, the solution of this PDE is equal to the conditional expectation of G, the terminal condition for, for the PDE, where what you do is you look at the conditional expectation of the diffusion process at time one, when you condition on uh, the point at time t. Right, and the proof is actually in this particular case because this is uh, th this PDE is homogeneous. The right hand side is equal to zero. The proof is very simple. You simply apply Ito's rule to um, h of x and t. Here, of course, you have to do a lot of prep work proving that Ito's rule is applicable. So you have to make sure that this function uh, h of x t is twice differentiable in space and once differentiable in time, et cetera, et cetera. But assuming that you've done this, a simple application of Ito's rule. It gives us uh, this expression and then we simply uh, note that on the right hand side what we have is uh, an integral involving the PDE, right? Uh, the, the generator comes from Ito's rule and then we know from our PDE because we assume that H solves that equation. That integral is zero and we end up with, uh, uh, with our formula. Right, so, so this is a very, very beautiful link between diffusion processes and second order partial differential equations. And, uh, and it's the presence of the Brownian motion that gives us that second order term. Um, how does it tie into things? Well, um, the idea really uh, due to Wendell Fleming is that you can connect the feynman cotts formula to a control theoretic problem. If you're, uh, if, if you're willing to look at it in just the right way. So in our case, I'm not gonna go into details, but the idea here is that uh, you can set up the um, dynamic programming uh, formulation for the optimal control problem. And as such, you end up with the value function. So the value function or the cost, optimal cost to go is simply you condition on your process uh, at time t, and then you just want to optimize um, over the drifts such that going forward from time t up to your terminal time one, uh, things are minimized. And once you define this uh, value function, we know that it has to solve another PDE called the hamilton jacobi bellman equation. In this case, uh, it ends up in a certain way. It, it's, it's also a parabolic PDE, but the right-hand side is not zero anymore. The right-hand side involves uh, 
this uh, squared norm of the gradient of our value function. And the terminal condition here is equal to our terminal cost. This is this negative log G. And we know from sort of stochastic control theory of diffusion, uh, di uh, control diffusions that the optimal value function, uh, or rather the optimal control is actually given to the negative gradient of the value function with respect to space, with respect to X. And this is a, a complicated nonlinear equation. And uh, well, Fleming noted but this idea goes back to uh, something called a cole hopf transformation in the theory of uh, uh, partial differential equations, that you can make this transformation, you, you, can, you can write, um, you can define an, another function h, which is gonna be exponential of minus v. And now it's just simple calculus. Once you transform this, you see that h in contrast to v actually satisfies um, another PDE, where the left where the left hand side is the same as in the Hamilton Hamilton Jacobi Bellman equation, but the right hand side is now zero, and the um, now the terminal condition is equal to g right e to the minus log g is g, right? That's the terminal condition for this problem, and of course now we know how to solve this. We know how to solve this using Feynman cuts, so we know what um, um, what v of x t is, right? V of X T is negative log of the solution uh, given by the Feynman cuts. And now we know what the optimal control looks like. I, in my opinion, this is sort of one of these really, you know, unexpected, uh, beautiful sort of uh, gems connecting uh, the theory of stochastic control, PDEs and diffusion processes. And, uh, and once you sort of make this identification, uh, the following result just more or less falls out. So what we, what we have is the following thing. So in our problem, remember our problem, let me actually go back to this. Here's our problem. Uh, minimize this cost over all drift processes. So for this problem, if we, if we write down the hamilton jacobi bellman equation, uh, we end up with uh, the solution given by the feynman cotts formula, right? So all, all of that just naturally drops out. And uh, this is really a synthesis of a number of papers that dealt with this, you know, control of uh, um, diffusion processes, non-equilibrium thermodynamics, and something going back to a very, very classical uh, paper by Erwin Schrodinger from 1930s that I'll, that I'll talk about in a, in a moment. Um, but somehow, none of the previous work really identified an explicit cost, explicit uh, control cost and terminal cost in this problem. Uh, so the control theoretic ideas were there, um, in, in particular in these papers by Pavon and Dipra, but um, there were sort of the, the control theoretic ideas were used sort of implicitly. Whereas here we really brought out the uh, um, full formulation of a stochastic control problem, both the control cost and the terminal cost, and it turns out that uh, um, everything just follows fairly, fairly naturally from this. Right, um, so this actually leads to a very nice thing. It leads to a variational principle that you can then uh, sort of uh, you can then bring to bear on the problem of uh, of inference. So let's see how that works. Right. So the idea is that um, choosing zero drift gives me the reference process. So let's let let's look at the overall path. Of, of my diffusion process, right? So it's the, uh, uh, an object that, uh, um, that varies over time, right? So it's a, uh, um, it's a stochastic process over the unit interval, right? So I'm gonna denote by P naught the distribution of the reference process, right? I'm not adding any drift. P naught is just uh, what's gonna happen if you don't add any control. P, uh, superscript u is going to be the corresponding process that, uh, that results when you do add a drift. And uh, we know that um, addition of a drift to a diffusion process results in an absolutely continuous measure. And that um, gives us a way to compute the uh, log likelihood ratio from uh, another beautiful result in stochastic uh, calculus, Gersonov's theorem. And Gersonov's theorem actually gives us a formula for the relative entropy or the KL divergence between these two uh, process laws. And that's simply equal to the expected value of, of the control cost, right? The expected value of one half integral over time of the squared norm uh, of the drift. And then um, 
it turns out that you can view the control costs that we're minimizing as sort of a free energy. You can think about the entropy uh, term as a uh, deviation from, uh, from sort of the nominal behavior with no drift. And then the energy term really is this terminal cost. And of course, now we see that um, the expression for the minimum of the three energy overall drifts involves only the reference process, right? So if you can compute conditional expectations for your reference process, then you can express uh, the minimum of the free energy over all possible controls as this negative log of this conditional expectation. All right, so, uh, and, and once you have this expression, then you can consider suboptimal drifts and that will give you various useful bounds. So let's first see how this applies to this problem of exact sampling, right? So, so notice how I haven't talked about any neural nets yet. We'll get to that. But for now, let's see if we can even uh, use this sort of a thing to, to sample from distributions. So this is uh, known as the Schrodinger bridge problem. I'll, I'll first define it and I'll explain where, where the name comes from. But here's the idea. Um, what we want to do is design a control, a drift, U star, that depends on X and T in such a way that the diffusion process, X, with that drift has the property that when we stop it at time one, X1 has a prescribed distribution mu, which we, uh, we're, we're going to assume it's absolutely continuous with respect to the standard Gaussian, right? So, you know, a sufficient condition for that as well. It has a positive everywhere density. Um, and what we want to do is minimize the control effort that we need to expend in order to obtain that, right? So, um, and the claim here is that, in fact, for any control U, such that at time one, we, we end up with a desired distribution, any control U will have the property that the expected control cost, this expected energy, the expected sort of uh, 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 amount of drift you add is lower bounded by the relative entropy just between the target measure mu and the standard Gaussian. And the optimal control actually has a very explicit form, which is called the Fellmer drift, uh, named after Hans Fellmer, who uh, had a very nice uh, sort of a time reversal interpretation of this. Um, here, the idea is that you take F, F is the density of mu with respect to standard Gaussian, right? So just if, if, if mu has a PDF, let's call it P, you divide P by the Gaussian PDF, that's your F, right? And so, and so the idea now is what you do is you take, uh, you take that F, the density of mu with respect to gamma, then you um, kind of launch it through the Gaussian, through the Euclidean heat semigroup, right? You just, what you do is you add, you take F, and you add Gaussian noise whose variance is kind of controlled, right? Depends on time. And you just reverse the time. Um, and this is the uh, Fulmer drift. So at time zero, what you're doing is you're adding Gaussian noise with variance one, standard Gaussian noise. And then as time goes on, the variance decreases as one minus T. So when time is equal to one, you no longer add any noise. And then you, and then you take the log of that. Um, so why is this called the Schrodinger bridge problem? In 1930s, Erwin Schrodinger posed the following sort of a, a interesting problem. Suppose we have a large number of particles that let's say are um, starting at the origin and then they're uh, undergoing supposedly the standard diffusion process, which is described by the standard diffusion equation, right? Um, so that's our, you can think about it as sort of a null hypothesis that they're just diffusing according to the standard diffusion uh, model. And because of that, we know that if this hypothesis were true, then at time one, we could look at the histogram of their positions and it should look, should look Gaussian. And now suppose we look and we we'll measure their positions and it's nowhere near Gaussian, it's some other distribution. Um, so Schrodinger wanted to know what is sort of the minimal, what, what is the more, most parsimonious explanation for this. And, and, uh, and the way uh, that, you know, uh, his formulation was finally sort of understood was in terms of relative entropy. What we're doing is we're adding an additional drift to the Brownian motion, which otherwise would describe standard diffusion to explain this uh, non-Gaussianness. And the minimal drift turns out to be sort of minimizing this uh, uh, KL divergence. Um, a lot of these ideas are sort of contained in Schrodinger's work, but it took uh, um, quite a while for, uh, for mathematicians and physicists to realize this, but this is called the Schrodinger bridge. 
And in fact, it could be sort of a, uh, one of the first instances of uh, an optimal transport problem where the criterion is sort of not really the expected distance that you need to uh, move sort of masses from, from one distribution to another, but somehow a more entropic transportation cost. Um, anyway, so this is the Schrodinger problem. It turns out that this is exactly what we want to solve if we want to exactly sample from a distribution mu. And you know, using this result, you can more or less reduce the problem of obtaining the Holmer drift to uh, a direct computation. Here, the reference diffusion is the standard Brownian motion, right? So B is equal to zero. So the reference diffusion is just the standard Brownian motion. Um, and then now uh, let's choose our terminal cost to be negative log F. So F here, again, is the density of mu with respect to the Gaussian uh, uh, um, measure. Right, so that's our control, uh, total control cost. You start at the origin, and then for each drift, you pay a price related to uh, integral of its uh, squared Euclidean norm, and then at the end, you look at the negative log uh, likelihood ratio, right, with respect to the standard Gaussian. And now it's just a direct computation. So we know what the, uh, we know what the value function is, we know everything. The reason why we know it is because, well, again, if you wanna compute the optimal control law and the cost, and things like that, you need to be able to compute conditional expectations for the reference diffusion process. And we, of course, you know, study the conditional expectations for the standard Brownian motion the first time we see standard Brownian motion in the, in the class on, uh, on stochastic processes. These are Gaussians. So everything really becomes simple. So for example, we know that the value function uh, becomes the negative log of expected value of, conditional expected value F1, uh, F of W1, right? That's our reference Brownian motion process. Given that the Brownian motion of time, time Q was at point X, and of course, by definition, this is precisely that uh, uh, Euclidean heat semigroup, right? That's just the computation of conditional expectations with respect to Brownian motion. The optimal control is, of course, the gradient of that. And the minimum cost is, um, is simply take your initial position at zero and compute this. And we know that this is zero, why? Because remember that F is the density of mu with respect to a standard Gaussian. And W1 has a standard Gaussian distribution. So you see that this is just uh, um, simply the integral of a probability of density over space, which is equal to one and log of one is zero. So we know the optimal cost is zero. And, and that means that essentially the energy that we expend in, in, in modifying the Brownian motion to sample from mu is exactly balanced by the KL divergence between mu and the, and the Gaussian, right? So, uh, and by optimality, we know that for any other mu that achieves this um, goal of having mu at time one, we know that the terminal cost would have to be zero. And therefore, all of the cost really is contained in, in this, uh, um, all of the cost is contained in this control, right? So we know that that's, uh, or rather, the optimal cost is zero. And we know that the difference between the control cost and the expected log F has to be non-negative. It's zero when the control is optimal. And this gives us the you know, simple control theoretic proof of the Fulmer drift. Um, so I'll come back to that in a moment. But for now, I just want to briefly, just very, very briefly, literally one slide, mention that the variational inference problem is also uh, a special case of this. So now in variational inference, now we actually have a parametric class of drifts, uh, B of X, T, and theta. And we want to fit theta to uh, a collection of observations, Y, right? So now we actually have this observation model for Y that's drawn on uh, conditionally on X1. And we have N samples from this, we want to optimize uh, or approximate the log likelihood. How can we even compute this? Well. It turns out that uh, variational Bayes for this particular class of models is simply an instance of our control problem, where now uh, the uh, terminal cost is equal to essentially this uh, um, negative empirical log likelihood. And uh, for each drift U, this gives, an, gives us an upper bound on the true log likelihood. And then by choosing various drifts, um, from a suitable parametric class, we can get a variational upper bound. In fact, this sort of led to uh, the work that we did with Belinda subsequently on neural SDEs, um, 
But in this particular um, paper that, that I'm talking about right now, we really focused on the exact sample. Okay, so now let's, um, let's really sort of ask ourselves, now that we have this framework, that we can in fact, if uh, sort of the complexity of the drift is no object, we can sample from fairly wide class of distributions. Can we uh, accomplish the same goals if we restrict the drifts to a suitably sort of manageable structured class such as neural nets, right? So, not, so I could call it sort of non-parametric sampling, right? We're not just restricting the form of F, this uh, density of uh, the target measure with, with respect to standard Gaussian in any meaningful way other than, well, it has to exist. Um, can we now do the same thing but um, restrict the class of drifts to some sufficiently rich family of functions that depend on space, time, and some finite dimensional parameter in such a way that if I were to give you a target measure mu, um, you could achieve epsilon approximate sampling. So here the idea is that each choice of the parameter theta gives us a diffusion process. Let's call mu hat um, the probability law of can I, can I ask a quick question? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh, where is this density coming from? The probability density. Wh who's giving it and in what form? Uh, in this case- In, in the application. Uh, oh, in the application. So this is, a, um, this is more of a universal approximation result. So think about the classical sort of neural net universal approximation results for continuous functions. Okay, understood, yeah. Right, so it's not for an application, just an approximation. Okay. No, it's, it's an approximation result. Right, but but the but the goal here. So notice, I'm what I'm doing is I'm restricting the drifts to have a, a parameter that is finite dimensional. So you could actually, uh, in principle, um, perform optimization not in the space of paths, but in the space of parameters if you want to fit uh, uh, these models to data. But but this is a universal approximation result. Excellent question. So here the idea is: if I give you a target f, can you sample? approximately from that measure, this F gamma, right? That's the uh, uh, Gaussian measure with, oh, you can think about F as an importance weight. Can I sample uh, in such a way that I end up um, with an epsilon in KL divergence at time one? Um, and so this is actually an extension of the universal approximation of function results to generative models. So There's an ability of uh, uh, neural nets to, to sample from distributions. But this is a neural SDE, of course, right? Because this is a, a here the, the dynamics is actually continuous time. And, and by the way, so you can think about this as sort of a, a one way of doing this is something like the Langevin process, which is a, a, a kind of a continuous time Markov chain Monte Carlo type idea. But in Langevin, uh, the optimal drift is time invariant, right? And then, and then the idea is that eventually asymptotically you're going to hit the desired density and you're concerned with rates at which this happens. Here, the idea is one to hit, uh, so the, uh, the ideal formal drift gives you the target density at, uh, in finite time. And what you wanna do is in finite time, you wanna obtain a sample from a distribution that's within epsilon and KL divergence from the target. Okay, so once we have that, here's a, here's a result. It, it, so it, it looks long. Uh, of course, I'm omitting the, you know, the, the precise statement of all, all the regularity conditions, but even then it looks kind of long, but let me walk you through it. So let's suppose we're given a target measure mu for x1 uh, and its density with respect to standard Gaussian has to satisfy the following requirements. Um, first of all, we require both f and its gradient to be Lipschitz and f has to be bounded away from zero. Um, boundedness away from zero, with respect, it's a density with respect to standard Gaussian, right? The, density, the, the actual PDF with respect to Lebesgue measure, of course, you know, will have tails. Um, but here, this is just a condition on, on the tails, right? If you, if you say that F is lower bounded by C and C is greater than zero, if you write this out in terms of uh, uh, probability integrals, you'll see that this basically, it, it's a condition on the tails of, uh, on the tails of mu. And then I'm, I'm interested in the following question. If both F and its gradient are effic efficiently representable by neural nets as functions, not as probabilistic objects, Really not, you know, so the, the, here the, sort of the probabilistic interpretation is sort of uh, incidental. F as a function and its gradient as a vector valued function. I'm assuming that they're efficiently approximable by neural nets 
on any compact subset, right? So if I can, if I can, get, if I can approximate the value of f and its gradient um, arbitrarily well by a neural net, can I sample from f from, from mu using a neural net drift? And the answer is yes. The idea is that give me a target uh, accuracy epsilon, then I can construct a neural net v hat that really takes now two arguments. So this neural net would take a vector in RD and the time instant in the unit interval and spit out a vector of dimension D. And this neural net will be polynomial. It, um, it's, uh, the size of this neural net will be polynomial in things like one over epsilon, D, et cetera. So all the regularity conditions in such a way that if I were to use this neural net and I feed time square root one minus T to that, if I use this neural net as my drift, and it has some parameters, this neural net has some time invariant parameters. But if I, uh, if I use this neural net as my drift and I stop this process at t equals one, then I end up with a sample from a distribution that's within epsilon away from the target measure mu in KL divergence. Um, so here the main message really is that the e efficient approximation of F by neural nets as a function implies efficient sampling from mu by neural SDEs. Kind of an interesting idea that, you know, that, that, that if f is uh, efficiently representable as a function by a neural net, then, then I can sample from, from f gamma efficiently by this neural SDE. Um, and so here the idea is that because this neural net v hat uh, is a conventional feed forward neural net, Right, so it has weights that uh, um, that you can fit to data now. This allows this paves the way for fitting these models to data uh, using backprop. Um, and you know, another interesting caveat here is that uh, we don't have to require the neural net representation of uh, of, uh, uh, of f to be quote unquote efficient. Doesn't doesn't have to have polynomial size in anything. But the idea is that the neural net construction for the approximate Fulmer drift will only incur polynomial overhead. So even then you can, you can actually quantify this overhead. Okay, so, uh, and I'll, I'll sketch the proof, but it combines a number of, sort of interesting ideas. Um, so here's the first, really first step. So the exact, so suppose I wanted to sample from this mu exactly, right? So I know what, what that, how to do that. I have to implement the Fulmer drift. And the Fulmer drift B, B, B star is really a, uh, you, you need to know F. You need to be able to compute um, sort of these um, um, heat semigroups, right? So it's kind of a, uh, you, you convolve F with a Gaussian and the variance of that Gaussian is scaled linearly, right? One, one minus T. And you need to be able to compute that in convolution integral. You need to be able to take its gradient with respect to space. And then you need to divide it by, by uh, uh, divide the gradient component wise by, uh, by the value of that, uh, um, of that convolution integral, right? Be because this is the gradient of, uh, th th this is the uh, gradient of the log of Q1 minus TF. So the idea is that if I can approximate each one of these steps by a neural net, I see that uh, now you, you just draw a little computation graph that gives you this, right? You, you, you first uh, approximate Q1 minus TF by a neural net, then you have another neural net that computes the gradient, then you have another neural net that computes the reciprocal, and then you have another neural net that computes the multiplication, you, you know, compose them together, you end up with, a, uh, with an overall neural net. This is the, you know, this, this uh, power of compositionality. And then by just keeping track of the sizes of these components, uh, you end up with an efficient approximation. All right, so, so how are we going to do this? Well, you know, so, so first the idea is instead of this convolution integral, the, this heat semigroup, can we just, uh, because it's an expectation with respect to Gaussian noise, the obvious idea is to use Monte Carlo sample, get enough samples of this additional Gaussian noise and just reuse them. So here the idea is to use the probabilistic method. So we sample enough samples from a standard Gaussian and just use them throughout. Here the idea is to make sure that we stay in a compact set, right? So that means I, I wanna control the maximum norm of these uh, Gaussian samples. And then just use empirical process techniques to show that uh, we can actually approximate this uh, uh, Gaussian heat semigroup 
to a desired accuracy on um, any sort of a, a any any ball in RD of desired radius, and the radius will then be tuned. So, but so here the idea is that once I have these points, I can more or less instead of having Q one minus TF, this the Euclidean uh, Euclidean heat semigroup, what I do is I appro approximate it by by an empirical average. Uh, and now it's obvious that you know within that empirical average we have a function f that is itself approximable by a neural net. So just uh, replace f with its neural net approximation. The same thing goes for so since I assume that f and its gradient can be approximated by a neural net, and such results of course exist. Um, then you know just take the gradient that's approximated by a neural net, and then uh, we end up with um, precisely the ingredients that we need in order to approximate the Fulman drift, right? So that's the idea. And if you want to get kind of into the uh, into the weeds with this, uh, this is sort of the the, the piece of the uh, uh, of the proof that uses empirical process techniques. So here the idea is the following: give me a radius r, give me a tolerance epsilon, and then we show that there exists n uppercase n, which is polynomial in one over epsilon d, l, and r. L here is the Lipschitz constant of, uh, of uh, f and uh, uh, the gradient of f. So polynomially in all these parameters, there exist n points for which the following three things hold. First of all, there are norms that all these points are contained in, in a ball of radius roughly eight, uh, well, let's say square root d times log n. Um, we can approximate the um, heat semigroup qt of f for all times t uh, between zero and one and for all points in our ball of radius r uniformly by this monte carlo um, sampling right this empirical average and moreover we can actually approximate the gradient of um, this euclidean uh, heat semigroup by this average of gradients over these points. And here the idea is the following. It really, like I said, uses empirical process techniques. So what we're going to do is we're going to define, we're going to think of our Gaussian noise, Z, as an input variable for functions that are indexed by two, uh, two quantities, time t, which lies in the unit interval, and the point x, which lies in the ball of radius r and rd. Um, so this is, a, this is a class of functions. Um, which is uniformly Lipschitz, and in fact, uh, it's grad the, the gradients of f are also uniformly uh, uniformly Lipschitz. Uh, and this class is actually because we're working with Gaussians, it's bounded in uh, psi two Orlich norm, the exponential uh, Orlich norm. Um, and when when z is sampled from a standard Gaussian, and of course, like I said, this applies to all first order derivatives of f. And so now, if you if you look at this, these are statements about uniform deviations of this uh, of, of uh, uh, an empirical process indexed by t and x from the expectations with respect to z. So if you can control uh, the probabilities of all these three events, you can essentially uh, guarantee that at least one choice of points z one through z n exists. You just need an appropriate tail inequality. So if, uh, if the class were uniformly bounded, you'd use Talegrand's inequality. Here you cannot because it's not uniformly bounded, but uh, thankfully uh, there is a very clean version of Talegrand type deviation bound by Adamchak for Psi-2 bounded classes. So here really, I mean, once you make this realization that, uh, that your Gaussian noise that you're going to add when you compute the Fulmer drift, that, that's sort of an input variable for, for a class of functions, you can use empirical process ideas and say, okay, so I can just sample n uh, times from a Gaussian and with high probability these samples are going to give me what I want. Um, and by the way, this, this, this sort of idea where you flip around uh, the, you know, the, the sort of the noise or the randomness and the input, um, this idea also appears in probabilistic proofs of universal approximations of functions by neural nets. So you can think about uh, your weights now being the, um, your weights being sort of the, the, um, the quantity to sample from, and um, your input to the neural net is, is, is uh, the object that indexes the empirical function, uh, the, empirical, uh, the, the function class for the empirical process.
Okay, so once we have that, once we have these points, the rest is really, like I said, just literally draw the computation graph and show that all of the pieces of the computation graph are efficiently implementable by neural nets, right? So, so now we know that f hat is a neural net. So uh, what I do is in my Monte Carlo approximation to uh, Q, uh, this QF, I replace f with f hat, I end up with a neural net. Each of these f hats is, uh, uh, we know it has polynomial size. Therefore, this composition and, and, and the number of terms n is polynomial and everything. So this has polynomial size. And because this is a neural net, which therefore has a nice computation graph that you can you know, use, use to implement it by essentially backprop, we know that we can compute its gradient using another neural net. So this is the cheap gradient principle, right? So uh, um, you can, you can, we know that the size of this uh, uh, neural net for, uh, um, Q hat F hat is manageable. Therefore, the size of, uh, uh, of the neural net that computes the gradient is also manageable. So now that I have, I can approximate in my Fulmer drift, I can approximate both the numerator and the denominator, right? When I compute the, when I compute the Fulmer drift. Now the, the, the rest of the uh, proof is just, okay, stitch them together. Now the rest is just arithmetic. We approximately compute this ratio right, using neural net approximations to multiplication and to uh, computing reciprocals. And here, of course, you know, uh, we use the fact that everything that we want to work with is bounded away from zero and it's bounded above by Lipschitzness and things like that. But the point is that we can actually uh, implement all of these operations approximately using neural nets. And then the rest is, well, we end up with some function and we clip it to its uh, minimum and maximum values outside its uh, outside the ball of radius r, as yet left unspecified. Essentially, using ReLUs, right? You can you can implement max and min operations using uh, constant number of ReLUs. So if you are allowed to use um, activation functions that include ReLUs, you can you can do this. And now that we have this neural net, we can com conclude the proof. So how you know what did we end up with? We know that for any radius um, of a ball, we can approximate the Fulmer drift B star by a neural net V hat. Um, so here V hat is a neural net that gives us uh, this B hat, which is V hat of X and square root of one minus T in such a way that over time uniformly and over a ball of radius R, we have epsilon, square root epsilon approximation. Well, I'll see why square root uh, rather than epsilon, square root of epsilon rather than epsilon in the moment. But the point is that this neural net is, uh, the size of that neural net is polynomial in, in all of the parameters we care about. Uh, and this approximates the Fulmer drift on a ball of radius R to a desired accuracy. Of course, now um, we're going to take this neural net and we're going to use it in, uh, in our approximation. So now I want to compute the Gersonov. Uh, I want to use the Gersonov formula uh, um, calculation here. Um, so here the idea is that, um, well, this should be a less than or equal to sign. By data processing, I know that the distribution between the terminal points, right? So the, the ideal diffusion, that's the Fulmer drift that gives a distribution mu. If I use my neural net from, from, from item one here, that, that's mu hat. So this is less than or equal to this quantity because this is the KL divergence between uh, the two processes. And now I just need to look at the expected value of this um, of the squared norm. So what I do is I choose a ball of radius R and I split the expectation according to whether we are in the ball or outside. Inside the ball, we know that uh, uh, this norm is bounded by square root epsilon. So that term is bounded by epsilon, right, right here. And outside the ball, well, so the idea here is that here the expectation is taken with respect to a Fulmer drift. That's the, you know, because that's the reference measure. Uh, and we know that the Fulmer drift in this particular instance is bounded. And because it's bounded, you can easily, uh, upper bound the probability that uh, diffusion with bounded drift strays outside the ball of radius R and, and that probability is actually inversely proportional to R. And the constant depends on things like the bound on the drift and things like that and the dimension, but you know, in a manageable way. But the point is that this second term, 
that you know controls uh, the behavior outside of a ball of radius r is proportional to one over r. So I just want that term to be smaller than epsilon. So I choose r appropriately. And then uh, you just stitch these things together and complete the proof, right? So, so really, the the main the main uh, sort of a, a, a technical tool here is once we can approximate the Euclidean heat semigroup by a finite size neural net, everything else is just more or less mechanical, right? You you write down the computation graph that you would use to compute the Fulmer drift, and you approximate every uh, you replace every node in a computation graph by a neural net approximation, keep track of the errors, and you end up with the result. Obviously, it's not an optimal construction. It's an existential proof that, that nevertheless shows that if f, which is uh, d mu by d gamma, is efficiently representable by a neural net, we can use that as a building block to, uh, to obtain an approximate sample. Okay? All right. Um, so now um, I would like to briefly discuss this idea of simulation, right? Because what I've shown you is that if you can essentially simulate SDEs in continuous time, then you can approximately simulate from a wide class of distributions. But obviously, how are you going to simulate this in continuous time? Especially if you want to compute various expectations uh, that are sort of the bread and butter of variational inference, right? So. How do we simulate this using finite resources, for example, discrete time? Uh, and this question of unbiased simulation of diffusions is actually a pretty, uh, uh, pretty interesting one that touches upon a variety of ideas. Um, so here's a problem we, we care about. So, um, so suppose I, um, I have some test statistics, a test statistic G that depends on both the latent variable X and on the observed variable Y. I want to estimate its expectation for you know, some value of the parameter theta, right? So I have my neural SDE and I want to compute this expectation. Um, really, you know, requirements are you know, things like efficiently computable, we want it to be unbiased, and we want it to have finite variance, right? The, the estimate of this expectation. Uh, and of course, um, by essentially the tower property, the tower property of conditional expectations. I can reduce this to the question of computing ex expectation uh, values of functions of only the latent variable, because I can simply just average the uh, observed variable away. So now that's the question, right? Expected values of, um, of some functions G of the terminal point of the diffusion. So, you know, the obvious thing that, you know, you look at simulating diffusions is the Euler scheme, right? So you, you, pick a, uh, you pick a mesh of your unit interval and you split, split, you split uh, the unit interval according to that mesh and you just update um, using this, uh, uh, this recursion, right? You look at the increments of the Wiener process at those times, you, know, you, you, uh, you, you add the, you know, the drift at those times. So this is basically kind of an um, iterative scheme that does this. Everybody knows the, the Euler scheme. Right, and then you estimate your v hat. So, so v hat is your estimate of the expected value of g simply by taking g and just uh, plugging into it whatever the Euler scheme gives you when it terminates. Um, well, so the problem is that generally the Euler scheme is biased. So if I were to look at the expected value of, uh, um, of this v hat and compare it to the target value expected value of G, typically this thing goes away, but you know, uh, uh, the bound is proportional to the, to the mesh size. And because of this lack of unbiasedness, once you start, how would you do this? You would, you would run this N times, you would, you know, you would run, you, you have N independent parallel runs of this, and you'd average the estimates, hoping that you reduce the variance, but you can actually show that now the variance will no longer scale as one over N. It'll scale as uh, one over n to power one minus delta, where delta will really depend on the exact uh, amount of the bias. And in Monte Carlo simulation, you know, one of the goals is really this, you know, it, it's called the central limit theorem rates or the Monte Carlo rates. You want the variance to go down as one over n. Um, so how can you do this? Well, uh, let's try uh, an interesting idea. And we're kind of inspired by a number of works in mathematical finance. Uh, that we're concerned with unbiased simulation of diffusion. Let's try a random mesh. So instead of a deterministic mesh, why don't we actually um, choose the points that partition the unit interval at random? Uh, 
So what we're going to do is um, we're going to select or draw a large number of IID random variables tau um, in such a way that uh, they actually place some mass outside the unit interval. And these tau's are going to be um, uh, non-negative valued. But the idea here is that you, you want some mass to be out, uh, you, want, you want these uh, random variables to be supported on something that contains the unit interval. And simply define kind of a re renewal process. Keep, you know, keep adding these, right, until you, until you exit the unit interval. So these are renewal points um, in the renewal process. And then now simply plug these in and let that be your random mesh. And they just run Euler Mariama based on this, right? Um, so here, it, it, that's actually kind of an interesting interpretation because if I have this neural SDE with my drift B, X, T, and theta, which is continuous time, this becomes now a discrete deep generative model with finitely many layers, but the number of layers is random is determined by this uh, realization of this renewal process. And the only random resource uh, that you need are samples from a Gaussian, that's to give you the, uh, the Euler updates, and the samples from tau. Kind of an interesting perspective. Um, and, and well, um, the estimator using this does not look pretty. Um, it uses some ideas from sort of a, a The proof really is based on trying to approximate something with a constant drift and then uh, restarting this using the mark of nature of the process and kind of iterating on this, uh, iterating on this using something called the uh, Dinkins formula for, uh, uh, for solutions of SDEs. And then you have to carefully uh, adjust these importance weights to give you what you want. So the exact form of the estimator doesn't matter, but, but the idea is that you, you can actually implement this um, effectively using uh, a deep generative model with, with random number of layers. But the main, uh, the main thing is that if uh, G, the function that you want to compute the uh, expectation of is Lipschitz, and if the drift of our model is Lipschitz in uh, space and um, hold our one half in time, which is typically going to be the case with our uh, uh, former drift, because you know that square root of time really enters into it. Then you can have an estimate which is unbiased, right? The expectation of v hat is uh, equal to the expectation that you want to compute, and its variance uh, is upper bounded by the moment generating function of the number of points, number of layers, evaluated at something that's kind of big O of log d which is the dimension. Um, okay, so, so let's see where we end up with, uh, uh, with the variance bounds. So the general observation, of course, is that the variance uh, of this V hat is really controlled by the moment generating function of this number of renewals n. So it's the number of points that you, uh, you end up with uh, in your random mesh. Uh, and therefore, that is related to the tails of the partial sums of these, right? So, uh, you know, you kind of open your uh, textbook on uh, renewal processes and you, and you see this. Um, so, one of the works that we were inspired by, by uh, uh, Henri Labardier et al, really did this with uh, your very sort of basic uh, standard diffusion, uh, renewal process, right? So, so the, uh, these, um, inter-renewal times tau sub i are exponentially distributed, let's say with parameter lambda. And then, uh, and then uh, the number of points n is a Poisson random variable, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the problem with it, so, you know, we have to compute the moment generating function of n evaluated at something that's log d, but the problem with the Poisson is that its moment generating function is actually doubly exponential in lambda. And because of that, we, have, we end up the variance, which is exponential in dimension, right? So doubly exponential in log D is exponential in D. Uh, and this, of course, uh, was noted by Henri Labardier et al. Uh, but the obvious thing is, well, you know, we don't have to use Poisson processes. We can use other, uh, other renewal processes. So for example, in a simple calculation using, using some large deviation estimates for uh, uh, MGFs, um, Let's suppose we take tau i's to be uniformly distributed um, 
on an interval zero, from zero to t, where t is larger than one. And the reason why you need to have this weight um, uh, outside, uh, why, why, why taus have to have support that's larger than the unit interval has to do with controlling the importance weights when you, when you simulate. Otherwise, you're going to end up with, uh, uh, it is possible to end up with uh, zero denominators, and then you know, the whole thing is going to um, be untenable. Um, but here the idea is that if you use um, sort of much lighter tailed renewal uh, times, then you end up with a variance that's quasi polynomial in, in, uh, in D. So it's going to be exponential in some polylog of D, which of course is still uh, um, still a limitation, but it's uh, at least not as, uh, as, as uh, harsh as just the exponential in D. Um, but of course, you know, implementing that is still its own sort of a can of worms because you know you, you really have to carefully tune the control variates and things like that. But at least theoretically, um, you can end up with an unbiased estimate of a test statistics that you want, a test statistic that you want, by taking your neural SDE and turning it into a, a very deep um, standard. Gaussian, uh, a latent Gaussian model with a random number of layers. And I think, I think that's an observation that really deserves uh, more scrutiny. Um, anyway, so this concludes the talk. Uh, the full paper was published in the Proceedings of Colt 2019, but uh, I guess uh, um, the link to the archive uh, version was posted in the chat. Thanks for listening. Um, well, so let's see uh, what kind of questions we get. All right, let's thank Maxim for the very interesting talk. Any questions? Okay, I will start with one question. Um, so in the uh, the two simulators that you presented, um, how do the variances of the unbiased estimator uh, compare to the naive bias estimator? Um, oh, um, so that- so Do you that, have exponential? Oh, but, but, oh, you're talking about the, the so, Yep. The naive bias estimate, just, just taking a standard Euler. Yeah. Um, so let's see. That one may actually have infinite variance in some cases. Um, but in general, on the other hand, if your G, I mean, if your G is, let's say, bounded, I mean, that, that gives you, that, that really, you know, you have a fi you, you have finite, finite variance, but because of the bias, once you start sort of optim, so, so here the, the, the idea is that you end up with, um, well, that's a good question. So let me, let me uh, gather my thoughts here. In general, if you want to estimate the variance of the naive Euler uh, estimator, that would really depend on the smoothness of, of G, right? Because uh, the exponent is, let me go back to this. Um, the exponent one minus delta depends on finer details of, of G and, uh, and on uh, um, the regularity of the drift. But in general, you will not be able to, so, so this is, I mean, in, in these broad terms, this is the best statement you can make. You're not going to get one over N scaling for, for N independent runs. You're going to get something that's much, you're going to get something that's worse. And this delta will really depend on sort of the exact trade-off between uh, bias and variance terms. So here really the goal is, uh, and obviously I'm not talking about constants in front of this one over N or one over M uh, one minus uh, Delta. So that, that, so this result really quantifies a constant, right? This, uh, because no, the variance of V hat is going to be, the, the variance of the, you know, N independent runs is going to be variance of V hat divided by N. So this result is only about the prefactor, right? And so, uh, if you use the uh, random mesh with uh, exponentially distributed uh, inter-renewal times, then you end up with something that's exponential. So e to the d, roughly e to the d divided by n. Whereas this, uh, if you if you tune this, you end up with like e to the poly log, poly log d divided by n. Um, in principle, it is it, it may be possible that somehow you end up with a milder dependence on dimension if you use a biased estimate. But again, that's uh, unlikely. Mm -hmm. Just because, ju just because of, uh, just because of the, um, um, 
just because of the of the way once you start computing variances of, of these Euler schemes I mean that's uh, you can end up with something that does um, that does depend on dimension but you know we haven't quantified it right okay um, so we have another question from David okay yeah hi so wonderful talk um, obviously I'm a big fan of this line of work and I was wondering maybe you can help characterize a question that I think you might get and I also get sometimes about the bias of these um, estimators in particular, you know, you're saying, well, okay, now if our approximate inference is driven by another, uh, by samples from an STE parameterized by a neural network, every step of those dynamics is just the cost of evaluating this network or its gradient. Um, you know, but if the dynamics are stiff or somehow, you know, ill-conditioned, then we might need like a very fine, um, discretization or like many yeah. steps in the right. I'm just wondering, like, do you have a general strategy for answering this kind of question of characterizing the asymptotic time cost of oh. you know, for STE solves? Huh. Um, yeah, I mean, that, so it's actually interesting. Yeah, I, uh, I haven't thought about this in, in great detail, but, but, but here you can actually see that, that in fact, uh, so if you take this heuristic, that lighter tails for inter-renewal times, uh, give you smaller variance. On the other hand, they obviously give you larger n with high probability, right? Because if you if your if your tau i is small with high probability, then then you'll need a large number of uh, of, uh, of mesh points inside your unit interval. Um, and then you would have to look at uh, sort of the tail uh, bounds for n. Um, and then you see that um, this is where you might end up paying a price. Like your, your N might actually end up being um, fairly large if you want to have an unbiased um, estimator with Monte Carlo rates. But obviously that would, that would depend on the choice of the distribution of tau. And you know, one should be able to compute it. Like for, for the case of uniformly distributed random variables that you know, it's, uh, the, the tails for n are closely related to the tails of the partial sums, and you can essentially use uh, uh, Chernoff bounds to, you know, to get an idea of what that would look like. Um, so yeah, I mean that, but clearly there's going to be trade-off. You're going to pay the price somewhere, and uh, based on this result, it seems like if you do want an unbiased estimator, and I'm not talking about here the, you know, uh, numerical precision errors and, and things like that, or you know, approximate SDE solver. Assuming your SDE, SDE solver is great, um, well, in this case, the SDE solver is this random mesh thing. Uh, assuming no numerical issues, um, your the amount of computation will be sort of proportional to this capital N, and uh, and the uh, values around which this capital N will concentrate will sort of be determined by by the tails of you know sums of tau, so you can you you could compute this in principle and kind of optimize this trade off. Um, I don't know if that answer your answers your uh, question. Well, I, it sounds like like it, I think you have a better handle on the computational complexity in this setting than I think in general for asking me like. I mean, notice that this is so. So this is sort of this slightly depart. This is departing from the the neural SDE philosophy, right? Because this is like oh, here's a solver, uh, which you can use if you want to estimate this particular expectations. It's obviously not a black box solver and it's certainly not a general purpose solver. It's a particular hack to get an unbiased estimate for, for, for a certain statistic. Obviously you can reuse, you know, the samples of tau and, and, and z's for, for different g's, but you know, but you'll need to compute a different estimator every time. There could be, you know, um, numerical issues there, but the point is that, um, really, uh, really the, the number of steps in the solver, the n, Sort of the uh, the smaller variance you want, the b better dependent dependence on dimension you want for your for your variance of the estimator. It's clear that you are going to pay the price in a like, larger number of layers. That would mean, of course, that you know the uh, you know the more layers you have, the more complex your backprop is going to be. Your memory usage is going to be you know affected by that. But uh, the the nice thing about this is, if you want to go this route, then you can essentially. Um, 
find large deviation estimates for for n and 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 that will give you kind of a guideline for you know what kind of computational resource you can expect to use up in this instance yeah, thank you all right any other questions All right, if there are no more questions, that concludes today's seminar. Let's thank uh, Maxim again for the great talk. Thank you. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you for having me. Yes. It was a pleasure. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm.